Okay, so welcome back for the afternoon session. Um, I'm, I'm Nick Woodhouse, I'm uh, chair of the Clay Mathematics Institute. And I'll explain in a second what we've got to do uh, with today's event. Um, I'm going to introduce, first of all, um, Ursula Martin and uh, Soren Rees, who are going to uh, talk about um, Ada Lovelace, uh, a scientist in the archives. Uh, Soren is a, a reader in computer science in London, uh, and uh, he's rather on the mathematical end uh, of computer science, but he also has an interest in computer chess, which I'm sure is something that uh, Ada Lovelace w would have enjoyed very much. Um, Ursula, I'm sure, is well known to all of you. I'll just make one remark about something uh, which uh, isn't in her uh, uh, biographical notes in the program, and that's that in uh, 1992, uh, she was appointed as the first ever woman professor in any discipline uh, at St. Andrews. Uh, so this is 140 years after uh, the, the, the death of uh, Ada Lovelace. I, I calculated that... Um, uh, her appointment uh, raised the rate of appointment of uh, rate of appointment of women professors at St Andrews from zero uh, to 1.72 per millennium. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but this is a mathematical institute. Um, anyway, I'm sure you're also aware that she has been the driving force behind uh, this afternoon, uh, uh, behind this whole event. Uh, she's uh, done an enormous amount of work. Uh, she's gathered together some quite spectacular speakers. So I think it's right uh, that we should uh, hear from her. One of the things she's going to, you're going to see a lot of in this talk are the uh, papers, the mathematical papers of Ada Lovelace, which are held in the Bodleian Library. And what I'm, uh, you may have picked up if you've read the program very carefully is that the Clay Mathematical Institute is uh, un undertaking a project to digitize these and they will uh, very soon be available online uh, in a watermarked form uh, and freely available uh, for the whole community uh, to see. <coughs> and we're very grateful uh, to the generosity of Lord Lytton uh, who has allowed us to uh, undertake this project. Anyway, um, I think uh, uh, let's I say no more, uh, but... Uh, hand over to, um, to Ursula and to, to, to Soren. So. Nick has said some of the things that I was going to say for me, but that doesn't stop me saying them again. Um, why are we doing this in Oxford? You see, it's very interesting. When male scientists have their 200th birthday, Typically, they belonged somewhere. Boole belonged to Cork. Turing belonged to Oxford and... Sorry. No, he didn't, did he? Turing belonged to... <laughs> Turing belonged to Cambridge and Manchester. Darwin belonged to Cambridge. Um, Charles Dodgson belonged to Oxford. Um, now, Lovelace was a woman. She wasn't attached to an institution. And suddenly, there's no institution to invest a lot of time and energy into celebrating her. Well, hang on, we better change that. Um, why do we think we in Oxford are going to do that? What do we have that's special? Well, we have this. Uh, we have the Bodleian Library. This is the new part of the Bodleian Library where some of you are coming to a reception this evening. And as Nick said, we have the fabulous archives of the Noel Byron and Lovelace families. Uh, 460 boxes deposited in the Bodleian by... I know Lord Lytton's coming later, I'm not sure he's here yet, but um, deposited in the Bodleian by Lord Lytton. Um, another um, birthday present to Ada is those of you who have struggled with the catalogue online, or the lack of the catalogue online, and have been working with the sort of Samizdat photocopies of the paper catalogue, which seem to be drifting out there. The Bodleian has now put the catalogue online. It's easier to find it by Googling it than me giving you um, a 10-foot long URL. But that's fantastic news for, for scholars. Uh, they've also made it rather easier to access the papers. Um, if you look, if you were used to accessing the papers by a rather complicated process involving mm, letters of recognition and so on, that's also gone. So that's the generosity of Lord Lytton and Bodleian. And I think that's a great uh, service to scholars, as is the digitization that Nick mentioned. Well, because of the presence of this archive, 
Um, I think it was Betty Toole who was sitting there in the front row, uh, who first of all said to Drummond Bone, who was here, was, was here a bit earlier, who's the master of Balliol, well, aren't you going to do something? Or did you say it to Richard Ovenden? Or did you say it to both of them? Anyway, you know, by force of personality, um, Betty made it so that the Bodleian agreed to have a display. And the Bodleian then looked around and thought, well, there must be somebody in the math department or the computer science department who'd like to help us with the display. And I, don't, I think I didn't duck fast enough. <laughs> um, I, didn't, I didn't really know, I, I have a sort of general interest in, in history and, and, and the history of science, but I didn't know very much more than anybody else about Lovelace before I embarked on this project. Um, but one of the things I rapidly realised was that although there is this remarkable archive, many parts of it have not been studied in the depth that they deserve. And in particular, I made the remarkable discovery that, well, some people had looked at Ada Lovelace's mathematics, like um, 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 uh, Bernard Neumann had written a short paper about Ada Lovelace's mathematics in the, in the 70s. No real historian of mathematics had done an in-depth study of her mathematical papers. And so we were very fortunate to um, get funding to secure to, for Chris Hollings, who's just been appointed to a lectureship in the history of maths here, and Adrian Rice, who is the world expert on De Morgan, to work through Lovelace's mathematical papers, particularly her 400-page uh, correspondence course with Augustus de Morgan. Well, there's lots of exciting things to say there, but I'm not going to say them because Chris is going to say them tomorrow. Um, but I am going to say some other things. This research has been really at the, at the heart of what we've, been, what we've done. Um, it's very exciting to be able to do new research in an area that appears to be so well worked over. Uh, but it's also motivated other things that we've done, some of which we heard about this morning. The partnership with the Computer History Museum in Silicon Valley, who are doing a, a digital version of, of our display in the Bodleian. Um, a group at Queen Mary University of London produce a magazine called CS for Fun. You should all have a copy in your plastic bag. Uh, they've done an Ada-themed issue. Um, just before tea, and that's why we must all keep to time, even me, um, just before tea, we're going to have a prize giving for the National Museum of Computing's Write a Letter to Ada competition. Um, so there's been a huge amount of and other stuff happening locally um, and, and nationally as well. So I think what I want to talk about is our thinking in putting together the display and use that to pick up some of my own reactions uh, to the archive and to, as a scientist in an archive for the first time, working on a scientist's archive. Uh, so we sat down to plan the display, we being um, Maddie Slaven, who is the, um, the director of exhibitions at the Bodleian, um, and then Maddie recruited a bunch of people to help and advise. Betty Toole came over and, and gave us her, it must have been about a year ago, wasn't it, Betty? Last October. Um, um, uh, Chris Hollings and, uh, and Adrian Rice. Um, but the, somehow, you know, I did mention not ducking fast enough. You know, the, the, a lot of the work, uh, the, the more detailed work, I had the privilege of working with Mary Clappinson on this display. If you were sharp-eyed, you saw Mary Clappinson's name there. Mary Clapp is Mary here? I don't think so. Um, anyway, so Mary is at the heart of many, many works to do with the Lovelace papers, because when these papers arrived in the Bodleian from the Lytton family in the 1970s, it was Mary who catalogued them. And Mary is um, credited at the front of many of the biographies. Some of the biographies are dedicated to Mary for her <coughs> extraordinary, extraordinary help she's been able to give people. So it was a real privilege working with professionals on designing a display. Um, and... Um, <coughs> Well, something else I'd never been involved in before either. And um, they kept saying, no, you can't have so much mass. Does anybody else get what that was about? No. Oh, well. Um, so what did we do? How did we plan it? Well, given the interest, given, of course, there's 460 boxes. <laughs> there's a lot of stuff to choose from. Um, we had a long list, a long, long list, a short, long list. Uh, and then the final decisions really came 
right down to the wire in thinking about the um, in thinking about the layout of the of the case and and so on. It's a tribute to the extraordinary resources that there are in Oxford. That here's our display. I hope some of you can see it. Only one item in that actually belongs to the Bodleian. <laughs> um, the rest of it is well. The paper, many of the papers, of course, belong to Lord Lytton. Some of the items in the middle belong to the Oxford's Museum of the History of Science, and you were hearing a bit about that from Doran Swade this morning. Um, the daguerreotypes um, belong to um, Geoffrey... Hello. Yes, belong to Geoffrey Bond, who I'll, I'll say a bit more about the daguerreotypes in a minute. Um, um, and some of the other items belong to Somerville College from the Mary Somerville Archive. And we planned it, we th sort of thought about three themes. We were thinking mainly about Ada, Ada Lovelace's scientific life, her mathematical life. We started over on the left with um, items related to her childhood, in the middle with items related to Babbage and the work on the engine, and on the right with items to do with her mathematics. We were fortunate to be able to get hold of portraits that people hadn't seen. Th these are distorted, aren't they? Um, does anybody care to fix that? I don't know how to. I'm sorry they're distorted. Um, um, the, uh, this is a portrait of Ada as a child that belongs to Somerville College. Now, those of you who read Ada's childhood writings will know she was very fond of cats. And you see she is actually holding a little chapbook with a picture of... It's, uh, it's obviously it's a long, long time before Beatrix Potter, but they're a little bit like Beatrix Potter cats. They're all dressed up. Um, but her mother um, ensured that she had a mathematical education. Um, this is one of her childhood mathematical exercises. And people often comment on her skill at abstract thought, at pulling out the principles of things. Now, here she's doing a sort of childhood, um, uh, a childhood mathematical exercise. And what's she doing? Well, you look at the top of the right-hand column. 2 times 5 plus 3 plus 4 equals 22. 2 times 5 is 10, plus 3 times 4 equals 22. But what she's saying in the words before is that she'd initially been thinking of it the wrong way around. Um, I had been wrong, as I thought you did 5 times 2 is 10, to which add 3 is 13, and then multiply the whole lot by 4. So she's, she spotted the principle of the thing. She spotted the... Um, uh, she, she's, she spotted, it's a rather charming thing to have in an archive and be able to put up. Um, when we were thinking about Babbage, well, we, uh, we talked to the Museum of the History of Science. We had to have a copy of the famous programme. Um, that's down bottom right. If you've been to the see the, muse see the display, you will spot that's not quite the famous programme as reproduced in Taylor's magazine. It's a different typesetting of the famous programme uh, from the um, archive in the Museum of the History of Science. And I think we haven't actually had time to go through it and see if it's had any of the typos corrected. Maybe, maybe some of the people working on this have. Um, we also had some, different, some bits of difference engine hanging up there, some of these bits that, that Doran showed us too. And this is where, um, you know, somebody who's not used to this, you suddenly get things that you never get before. In the process of planning this, I got to go into the Museum of the History of Science and pick up some of these things, you know, wearing special rubber gloves and, and all. And I hadn't clocked before. They're big bits of metal. They're very heavy. <laughs> and the physicality of this machine. Um, I've got somebody working for me at the moment who keeps telling me how materiality is important. OK, Vasilis, I get it. <laughs> the materiality of this. This wasn't numbers as, you know, abstract things, you know, just in, being calculated on your phone. This was computing as a physical thing with these big, as, as, as we were hearing this morning, these big clanking machines. Um, we also looked for some letters. Um, uh, this is a, a letter. It's a bit hard to read, but it's rather nice because this is, you know, the, the correspondence between Lovelace and Babbage was, um, uh, you know, had, had its own particular tone, Babbage being very flattering. Uh, this is Lovelace writing to her mother and complaining, uh, complaining that Babbage is so wretchedly disorganised. If he does consent, basically she's saying, look, if he lets me be his, his project manager, then we'll actually get this dratted engine built. 
Uh, well, Babbage wasn't having any of that. Um, but I think it's rather... Um, he is beyond measure, careless and desultory. Well, I think we were in the... Weber put up the slides of his last attempts to write an account of the analytical engine, where he sort of writes two pages and then starts doodling on something else. He's beyond measure, careless and desultory at times. I shall be willing to be his whipper in. <laughs> well, that, of course, is a metaphor from the hunting field. The whipper, the whipper in is the person who runs around the back and herds the hounds, isn't it? Somebody who knows more about hunting than me? Yes? Thank you. <laughs> um, so she was going to be Babbage's whipper in, but it didn't quite happen. Well, in the third bay, that was where we got to think about the mathematics. Um, and that was where I was told, less is more. No, you can't. No, you can't have that one, Ursula. No, nobody will understand it. Oh, all right. They were right, actually. <laughs> they were right. Um, um, so what did we end up with? Well, we had another image of Lovelace. I'm, oh, gosh, this is not distorted on my... Sorry, somebody, somebody, can, somebody can instantly see how to undistort this. But it's the same image as it, if you look at your program, it's the image on the front of your program. Now, the history of this image, um, this image is actually reproduced in Doris Langley Moore's biography of Lovelace, in the, uh, written in the 1980s, the one dedicated to Mary Clappinson. And um, so, and I read this book, saw the image, and thought, oh, well, that's nice, image of a daguerreotype. I wonder where it is. And thanks to the power of the network, it turned out I was only two away from it. Um, I asked the arbiter of all things Baron where it might be, drum and bone. And he said, well, the expert on um, Baron portraiture is Geoffrey Bond, who's sitting at the back there. He might know. And indeed, he did know because he was sitting about two yards away from it at the time he got the email. Um, and Geoffrey has very kindly lent it for the display. Well, if you know daguerreotypes, it's tiny. It's tiny. Um, and he's allowed us to, uh, to, to, to reproduce it and, and distribute it with appropriate credit. And it is extraordinary. Um, Doris Langley Moore had the wrong date. We've, we've, we've dated it. Um, it says on the box, Claudette. Claudette was a daguerreotypist, famous daguerreotypist, um, who set up shop in London um, in the early 1840s. Um, he, he was quite a pioneer the daguerreotypist. In particular, he was a pioneer of using painted backdrops. And the painted backdrop in this is exactly the same as the painted backdrop in um, a daguerreotype he made of, uh, of, of Fox Talbot, so we can, which is dated. So we can date it at about 1842-43, which is about the time when she wrote the paper. Um, and I think it's amazing. I think it's amazing because she, you know, many of the daguerreotypes, women of that period, well, they were presenting a certain image, a certain image they might be, if they were having a portrait painted with their husband or, you know, aristocratic women, she looks intense, she looks fierce, she's, she's uh, I mean, you can say it's because they were ha had to sit in sort of neck braces to have their uh, daguerreotypes taken. Uh, Claudette had found a way of doing away with the neck brace. So uh, it, it, it's a remarkable image. And thank you very much, Geoffrey, for allowing everyone to, to see it. It's um, quite remarkable. Um, but then another treasure. I just get to talk about the fun, my fun treasures, you know, because I'm an amateur at this. Now, this was, this was my wow moment in the archives. Um, so, okay, lots of people put up their hands earlier on and said they were computer scientists. Okay, computer scientists, what is this a picture of? Königsberg. Königsberg. Exactly. Well, you knew, Doran, because I've told you before. <laughs> it wasn't you. I thought it was you saying Königsberg. So, but, you know, just imagine. I'm, you know, I'm an amateur to this archive stuff. But the thrill of turning over the pages in this box of archives with Mary Clappinson and looking at this and thinking, wow, I'm the first person to look at this box who knew that, what that was. It's so exciting. Um, so, Königsberg, what that, what's that all about? Well, this is a page where Lovelace and Babbage are doodling. Um, we don't really have a date on it, but it includes various things that they've talked about in letters at various times. So... But they were friends for a very long time, so we don't know. Um, but Königsberg is a problem. Königsberg is a problem all about you've got a river and bridges. And what you want to do is to walk 
on a circuit starting, let's say, bottom left, walk around, cross over all the bridges and come back to where you started. Well, more materiality. Look at that. The river and the bridges are drawn in that really smudgy ink. It was probably a quill pen that hadn't been sharpened. Somebody told me that. I mean, <laughs> who knows about these things? But the walk, you see, is pencil. And it's been done while the ink is wet. And so as it's dragged along, it's sort of dragged through the ink. Um, more materiality, whatever was going on here. Of course, what we would really love to know is what's going on with these dots. You know, wouldn't we all love to think it was an algorithm for something? Well, the jigsaw puzzle remains, and thanks to the digitization that Nick announced, this image will be on the web and we can all have a go at cracking the, cracking the puzzle. It's another element. I've been walking around full of glee showing this to people, and um, I showed it to a friend of mine. Um, who's an expert in a different part of recreational mathematics. And he spotted something I hadn't spotted. And now, um, just to keep the audience on its toes, Soren is going to come up and explain what's going on with that. Some of you will guess what that is. Soren, you want pen? I think I lost this. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, so, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so what we have there is uh, what in modern terminology is called a, a magic square, as you can see. And so what struck me when I, I saw this document, but also so the, the magic square there, is that it shows that Eddie Lovelace was both a mathematician, but it also showed her as a computer scientist. And let, let me explain that. If you look at the numbers in this square, you'll notice if you add them up along each row or each column, you get the same result, namely 15. That's what is called a magic square. So the numbers add up to the same thing. But the thing is that this is not just numbers produced by some try and error process. It's actually, you can see from the, uh, the context, for example, from this document here, you, you can see of this part of the document, you can see that he's actually following a, an algorithm, what we today would call an algorithm. This is a procedure of simple steps. Um, and that procedure is then putting the numbers in place. So let me illustrate this idea with some um, uh, slightly different example, but also from a magic square. And this is a, a something that is wonderful to teach uh, children. Uh, so the algorithm itself is very easy to understand. That's exactly what an algorithm is. Every step just follows some simple rules. So I'm not going to go into details with the, with the procedure I'm following. I'll just fill in the numbers here. Um, but essentially what I'm doing is I'm going up and to the right all the time and when I get to the end here I follow a rule that is telling me that I have to come in from the other side. So we have four here, five here and now I bump into one, I get, well, I'm stuck and then there's another rule telling me then you just go one down. You continue up to the right, up to the right. Here I get out of the paper here so I continue down here. I get out again of the paper according to a rule, I come in on this side, the ten. I bump into something, I follow another rule that tells me I go down, the rule from before, continue. I sort of bump into the corner, again I'm stuck. Uh, so I go one down, 16, 17, come up here, come down, 18, 19, 20. Bump into a number, go down, 21, 22, 23, 24, come in here and come in here, 25. A and that's a... Uh, the amazing thing here is that this is indeed uh, very amazing because if you add up the numbers here along each row, you get 65, 65, 65. All of them give 65. The sums here, 65, 65, 65. The diagonals add up to 65. The other diagonal to 65. You can even add up the corners and the one in the middle, you get 65. You take the middle points here, add up, you get 65. There are lots of medical properties here. But of course, from a computer science perspective, I would say that the magical thing is that this algorithm, this procedure works. Why does it work? So we have two aspects. We have, we have the procedure itself. You can teach children, and it's a wonderful way to introduce children to, to the mystery of uh, mathematics and, and algorithms. On the other hand, it's, it really takes a mathematician like Ada Lovelace uh, to work out why this kind of algorithms and procedures uh, uh, work. So I think that's all I will say, and I'll leave it to Thank Ursula you, to continue. Thank you. Well, Ed
Ada Lovelace retained her interest in mathematics. And, and one has to pause and think about mathematics in the cultural context of the day. Um, it was the age when people were starting to, and why was, why was Babbage building his engines, building his engines to compute tables? Why were they computing tables? Because they were seeing the, the, the power of mathematics in collecting data, modeling data. Um, they were producing data for uh, tables for insurance, tables for tides, tables for plant growth. It was the age of uh, 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 you know, people collecting data, sending it in to organizations like the Royal Statistical Society who would correlate, organize it, write papers. All of that kind of thing was starting to happen. And William Lovelace, Lovelace's husband, uh, became rather interested in scientific approaches to agriculture. And he wrote several lengthy papers um, addressing this sort of point, which is, uh, as far as we know, Lovelace's only other published work is footnotes to these papers, um, criticizing various possible models for plant growth. Um, but I picked out another footnote, which shows her broad scientific interests. This one, she's actually talking about photography, not from the point of view of having her photograph taken uh, like, a, like a grand lady, which she was. Um, but the, the power of photography in instrumentation, if you're trying to measure light levels, measure clouds. So um, scientists like Herschel, other uh, photographic experimenters like, um, like Talbot, like Claudette, were also very interested in um, equipment, uh, um, scientific equipment on photographic principles. And you know, this is, if you've read much of Ada Lovelace, this is pure Ada Lovelace, this tone. The present object is merely suge to suggest to Mr. Gasprin. One feels a merely sort of suggest from Ada Lovelace had a certain amount of force. Um, and to other scientific agriculturalists, how accurately the two instruments above, the actinometer and the actinograph, which were, were Herschel's instruments, um, would supply the desired data as regards light and heat. Mr. Gasprin seems to write unaware of the means which photography has offered towards the easy and delicate appreciation of this. Um, and so on and so forth. And there are other papers where she talks about the, the importance of photography, the importance of the experimental approach. Uh, towards the end of her life, she started thinking, and that there's a lot been written about this, and I'm only telling you about it in 30 seconds, so I can't say terribly much, but she started thinking about what she called a mathematical model of the nervous system or a calculus of the <coughs> nervous system. And she started thinking about it both in mathematical terms but in experimental terms. Uh, she, she drew up quite, it's not clear how much experimental work she did, how much mathematical work she did, but just the way she wrote about it is, is, is rather extraordinary. Um, we've got the whole of this in the bodily and display, but she says, I hope to bequeath to the next generations a calculus of the nervous system. Now, a calculus of the nervous system to scientists today, um, you know, sort of, you know we, we can kind of figure out what we probably mean by that, but for somebody to say that in the 1840s, to be thinking that way, I find quite extraordinary. Um, and I think, um, I know it's not something that's been written about in perhaps the depth of cultural positioning it might have been. Um, and I think this is a bigger question about Lovelace. One of the things that fascinates me about, as a scientist, um, coming at this, I thought, well, I suppose there are several things that have fascinated me. First of all, I'm always tempted to say, gosh, it's such fun working in the Bodleian, but... I realise that's a, you know, this, it's like a box of chocolates. There's all this amazing stuff, but I realise that's a bit like, you know, a, a typical response when people math, meet a mathematician. People sometimes say, "I could never do maths at school," <laughs> and you know, sometimes people meet somebody on the humanities and they say, "Gosh, it must be nice reading books all day." You know? <laughs> so, <laughs> so saying to the Bodleian, "Wow, you're a box of chocolates," is a bit, you know, but it, but they are. It's lovely. There's all sorts of amazing stuff. Um, but it's brought to me a new realization, I think, of two aspects. First of all, that scientific archives um, are important. Scientific archives are important uh, for the for present day scientific problems, not just for the history of science. So, all this data that people were gathering at the time. Oh, so, John Clare was writing poems about the disappearance of some bird or other. Somebody else was modelling the plant that that bird ate, which was. Why it was disappearing, because the plant was disappearing. Those records are somewhere. We can go back. We can go back and use that information in the spirit of, well, it won't be not very big data. Oh, no, that, that data is still there for us to use as, as scientists today. But also is the bigger issue of 
to really understand what's going on, you need the cultural context, you need the, the humanities background, you need the social science background um, to look at where these ideas come from, as, as Adrian Johnston was saying this morning. You know, these ideas of machinery, of operator, of function, you know, they, they, they didn't just appear in a vacuum, they appeared in a cultural context as well as a scientific context. And this is another quote from the famous paper, which, um, you know, be bears out what I think, um, I, I'm not the first person to say, somebody needs to take this paper and study it as a literary object, as a, not just as a scientific object. Those who view mathematical science not just as a vast body of abstract and immutable truths whose intrinsic beauty, symmetry and logical completeness, when regarded in their connection together as a whole, entitle them to a prominent place in the interests of all profound... Oh, God, is there a comma anywhere? <laughs> in the interests of all profound and logical minds, but as possessing a yet deeper interest for the human race, when it is remembered that this science constitutes the language through which we alone can adequately express the great facts of the natural world and those unceasing changes of mutual relationship which visibly or invisibly, consciously or unconsciously, oh, to our immediate <laughs> physical perceptions are interminably going on in the agencies of the creation we live amongst. And suddenly we've got to the creation, we've got to theology, we've got to contemporary uh, views on theology and the nature of mathematics. Well, is she feeling she needs to put a bit of that God stuff in so she's not getting into trouble? Uh, no, there's rather something rather deeper than there going on, I think. Oh, I got to the semicolon, right. Those who thus think on mathematical truth as the instrument through which the weak mind of man can most effectually read his creator's works will regard with a special interest all that can tend to facilitate the translation of its principles into explicit practical forms. In other words, the, um, the machine, you know, the machine is an instrument of God's work as well as being... Um, I find, you know, I find that kind of, kind of sentiment quite extraordinary. And I find, you know, the conclusion I've, I've drawn from all this, humanities people, please let me keep coming to talk to you and I'll try not to call the bodily in a box of chocolates. Um, um, and let's work together on finding out exactly what was going on here. Thank you. <laughs>